work to this computer. All right, now I'm recording. All right, so we just, so that was the introduction. All right, so let's try a couple of these with, in slightly different circumstances. What are you looking at, Dr. Tag? Because I just see what you drew. Oh, is it not? Is my screen not up today? Anybody else? Yeah, I can't see any. Oh, it's either. paused. Oh, I wonder why it's paused. Let me um, let me do it again. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. It looks. I can see it on my screen, but you can't see it on yours. There, so you should see it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's really weird that it froze it and didn't show me. You know, just answer a question. Doesn't matter what question. Just answer one. You know. You're supposed to be using your psychic mind powers to connect to me. Well, that's a bit of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, your green, your answer was getting green screened away anyway. So A is the right answer. It's down in the front side of the loop, right? So let's walk through it because because Stephen got it backwards. So, um, so you have a you have a field to the right, and it's getting smaller. So the loop is going to attempt to counter that by increasing that magnetic field. So it attempts to increase that magnetic field to cancel, to cancel that change. And so to increase the magnetic field to the right, it has to create a current that's like this. And like this is down in the front and up in the back. Well, I thought that the uh, loop, I thought it was decreasing and that was as a result of the current decreasing it going the other direction. I thought that was, it was the- Yeah, no, so this is the external field is decreasing and so it, and so this is the current, and this is always how we're going to, how we're going to bring up this model. Now you're right. The total field in here is actually going to become a combination of the two things, but I don't want you to think about that. That's actually one step too complicated. So also one thing to remember is that a field because of this loop is actually going to usually be very small. Usually it's the external field that's really going to be the big thing. So it's attempting to fight it, but it's, it doesn't fight very hard. All right, let's do. But mainly I want to get just on which way is it going, does it work, does it happen at all? There's nothing green in this picture. The black, the black rail is fixed. Yeah, I'm confused by this, by this question. Yeah. So 
Remember what's happened is we're looking for a changing flux, which is B dot A, right? It's how much field times how much area. So we don't need a changing magnetic field, we need a changing magnetic flux. So as the rod moves to the right, we change the flux inside the loop. So that is to say there's more down, there's more in arrows, there's more tail feathers in the loop. So that means there's more field headed away from us. So that means there's the flux, the flux changes into the page. So the loop attempts to fight that and makes a field out of the page. To make a field out of the page, it has to go around this way, which is counterclockwise. So we'd expect a counterclockwise current. Now the specifics of this, this is an example that's used all the time because this is one where we can actually easily compute what the flux is. Is in this case, the flux is going to be equal to B times A. Um, there's times cosine theta, but in this case, the area of the surface, which is the area across this thing, and the B field are in the same direction, right? So there's no, so those two things are the same, or, or they're 180 degrees. So the, uh, the only thing changing here is the area. And the area you could take is L times X, right? So the area is L times X. And so the flux is B times LX times cosine theta, which is just one. Okay, so now we can take that. Let's give myself a little bit more room here. So if the magnetic flux is B L X and X is changing because the rod is moving to the right. So as the rod is moving to the right, X is equal to the velocity times time because B is equal to X over distance over time. That tells me where, where the rod is. And then what Faraday's law is, is that the induced current is equal to negative D flux DT. And the negative sign here just indicates which way the current wants to flow or which way the voltage is created. So that part isn't really very important. For our purposes, we've already worked out which way that is. If we drag it to the right, we know we have a counterclockwise current. So if I just want to know how much voltage I get, well, that's going to be D flux DT, which is D DT of B times L times X, and X is equal to VT, is that. So if I take the time derivative of that, well, B is a constant, L is a constant, V is a constant if I keep moving at a constant speed. And so, that, so I have a T there, so this is just B L V. And that would be the voltage that I get if I do this. Because I would get a volt, so if I put a voltmeter right here in my circuit, it would measure a voltage that was proportional to how big the magnetic field is, to how fat this region is, and to the velocity at which I'm moving the rod to the right. So the faster I move it, the more my needle is going to twitch. So that would be the potential. And then we could say, let's say I put a resistor in there as I'm moving that, that rod to the right. So if I put a resistor in there, R, then the current that's going to run through is going to be epsilon over R because, because this is just acting like a DC circuit, just like the ones we've analyzed many, many times. So the current here would be B L V over R, and that'll tell me actually how much current I have. So you can use these rules. So the, so the rule here, this is actually a very simple operation. Once you understand derivatives, time derivatives, which we've been doing for a whole year now. Right? This is nothing, there's nothing really, really brand spanking new about this. So, is, so the main problem is figuring out if there's an induced current and which way is it. And then figuring out the actual quantity is relatively straightforward. It's, it's not a difficult computation. What changes in this situation? All your photos in the lab. 
Right, so why is it C? Why is there nothing? Because the magnetic field is parallel to the loop. Right, so what, so what is that in our expressions? In the mathematics, what is that, where does that show up? The dot product of BA. Yeah, that's right. So they're, they're, they're in the same direction, or they're in opposite directions. So the, so the area is pointing out of the page and the B is pointing this way. So they're at 90 degrees to each other. So there's nothing, so there's no overlap here. And that never changes. No matter how we move this guy, the flux is always zero. So because the flux is always zero, there's no change. That's the important thing is there's no change in the flux. It's not important that the flux is zero. It's important that there's no change in the flux. Because of course you can have something that's zero but changing. I can be not, I can be um, at zero position, but moving. I just noticed Steven's background. Yeah, it's clever. If you haven't already, you can put yourself in gallery mode so you can see everybody's faces. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's fun. We had a physics gang would be throwing gang signs. Okay, we got we got all the different answers. Okay, Matthew, why are you saying zero? Matthew? Are you giving up on that position? No? Don't want to talk? Not listening? Okay. We'll move on. Uh, Calvin, what did you have? I can't remember. I had B. You had B? All right. So how do you get to that one? Um, so like the current created by the, the straight wire is into the page. And then it's decreasing. So the, so the, so the, field, so the field is into the page. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, what I'm going to say. The field's yeah. into the page. And then, um, so it's decreasing, the field is decreasing, so the field inside the loop is getting smaller into the page, so it needs to create a field into the page. So right. it's going so it to reinforce it. Okay. And so if you're making a field into the page, thumb into the page, loop around, and that way is clockwise. Is that correct? I also had that same answer, but I was thinking about it differently. So I did the, the thumb along the, if we put the thumb along the loop going counterclockwise, then the- Thumb, on the loop, put the thumb along the loop going counterclockwise, okay. Yep, and then we curl our fingers around the thing, then that'll be going out of, that'll be going into the page on the outside of the loop. That'll be keeping the, um, feel the same. I think Calvin's way of talking about it is, is, is easier, right? So the picture you should be drawing, and, and it's okay to be drawing pictures when you do this, right? You've got, you got paper in front of you. The picture I draw in my head when I do this is, this wire is creating a field into the page here, right? And then, and then the after picture, it's into the page, but smaller, right? So this is over time. As it goes into the page, then into the page, it's smaller. Okay, so that means I want more into the page, and more into the page is clockwise. 
I actually tend to draw these pictures for myself so that I know I've got it the right way around. So I've got it in my head. Let's do a slightly different one. Yeah, that's right. It's in, it's clockwise. Say, right? Put my thumb along here. It means this guy is making a field into the page. As I move the wire away, the field is getting smaller. It's because it's getting weaker because I'm pulling the wire away. So the field is getting weaker, which means the loop attempts to reinforce that by creating a stronger field into the page. And the field into the page is created by a clockwise current. So that's a clockwise current. Lenz's law is really, really hard. It is you know, a really obscure, weird rule. It is still the best way we have of discussing it. We could write down a mathematical statement for it, but it's, you know, it really is the easiest way of talking about it. Okay, now I'm gonna go through a couple more of these, but this one's gonna actually have a demo at the end. It's kind of cool, so I'm just gonna walk through it. So let's say I have this situation. Why zero, Ian? <laughs> Technical difficulties. All right, is it working now? Yeah. All right. Um, not really sure about the zero. It was more the question mark that I was answering for. Uh -huh. why, why is that? What's uh, confusing about it? Um, this is a slightly different circumstance we've done this before, so. Yeah, I don't really know. I just figured because like most of the field is running north and south. Right. I wasn't really sure what yeah. direction that contributed to. Right. This so this is a little bit so this one is a little has got a little bit of a um, strangeness to it. Because remember we've got these field lines doing this. So if we burn a hoop here, it's kind of not entirely clear what's going on, right? Well, the, your intuition, my intuition says that, uh, well, if I bring this North Pole down, the field's gonna be increasing, and that's true. One of the things in particular to remember is that these, is that you have to count the field lines that are going through the magnet. So as I bring it further down, right, more and more of these guys, uh, ah, more and more of these guys are penetrating the loop. Like some of these are escaping. Um, and are not going through the loop until I bring the magnet close enough, and then I get them all in there. So the flux is definitely increasing. The magnetic field is definitely increasing downwards. So the flux is definitely getting bigger uh, all the time, right? Until the magnet gets halfway through, and then maybe something changes. All right. So if the so the flux is getting is is increasing in the downwards fashion. So that means if the flux is increasing in the downwards fashion, it means it tends to fight that by creating a flux upwards, a flux upwards is like this. So if we're looking at it from above, that would be counterclockwise. Everybody good with that? 
So I think people had mostly had B, right? It's, it's easy to get confused on the geometry here. Now, let's just back up a step. So if I have that counterclockwise, this little loop of, of wire is making a magnetic field. Which way is that magnetic field? Right, it's A. It's creating a magnetic field up. Yeah, it's going to repel. Because this guy is like the loop is making a little, is liking a little north-south magnet. So I've got the big magnet coming down north-south, and this guy's kind of making a magnet like this, right? Because that's what a loop of current does, is it makes a magnet. So these guys should repel. Now, so if you drop a magnet into a loop, the magnet should slow down. And that's not always easy to see, but I do actually, can actually do this for you. Now let's see if I can back up and. So what I've got here is I've got a, oh, here, let me turn off my screen share. So, um, so what I've got here is I've got a uh, aluminum pipe. And you can tell this guy is aluminum. He's not magnetic at all. I've got this strong magnet here and he's totally not sticking in any way. I've got a little tiny neodymium magnet here that can fit inside and he's not sticking to it. So this is not a metal, this is not a ferrous tube. This is an aluminum tube. Okay. And this aluminum tube has got nothing in it. If I stand up and let me see if I get a piece, like I had a pen around here someplace I'd be there. I don't know where I put it. Something small I can drop through this. I had a bit, I had a little piece and now I've lost it. We've got good old classic clue, Dr. Tag in his office with an aluminum pipe. I'm an aluminum pipe in my office, right? Yes, exciting, exciting science. Right. Normally I do this in front of everybody in the classroom, so the pipe's a little too big. But just to show, so if I take a paper clip and if I put it into the pipe, I bend it so it's not, oh, the paper clip's sticking. Ah, anything will fit in. Oh, this thing will fit in. Maybe. No, let's just put, let's put it. Ah, I had a thing here. I don't know where I put it. No, there's a, no, that's too big. Ah, I had a little pen. Oh, too big. Pencil. Oh my gosh, I feel so unprepared. Read your professor. Can't even find a pencil. All right, so I put a pencil at the top of the tube and I'll let it go. Pencil comes straight out. Okay, so there's nothing, there's nothing in this tube. This is a perfectly ordinary tube. Pencil comes straight out. Now I'm going to take my little neodymium magnet, which I've already lost, because my office is a complete mess. Oh, I see it attached itself to something. So now I'm going to take my little neodymium magnet and I'm going to put him in the top. Okay. Took that long to come out. You can actually hear him going through the pipe. So the. Oops, where's my. Hello. So the um, uh, so what's happening is exactly the circumstance we just described. So I imagine the north pole of the magnet is down. As it enters the pipe, it's creating a current that's running around this pipe like this. So every ring, so every bit of this pipe acts like one of those rings and forces it back. And so this is creating an induction in this ring. Now what's happening is, so there's two ways of thinking about this. One is the way we just went through, where there's a force created by that ring of current. There's also another ring of current immediately above the magnet. And if you work through the math on that, you can actually tell it's pulling the magnet back up. So both the, both the ring below and the ring above are impeding the magnet's process, progress, and they're both creating a force on the magnet. But there's another way of thinking about it, which I think is even more interesting, which is to think about energy. Right? So when I put the magnet in, I'm losing potential energy in order to gain kinetic energy. And that's what just happens if I drop the magnet. Right? There's nothing going on there. 
But if I put it in here, it's creating loops of current and it's creating loops of current in a resistor. And a resistor, when it has current running through it, heats up. So there's energy coming from somewhere to create that, to create that um, heat. So the, the tube is heating up slightly when this guy's going through it. That energy has to come from somewhere, so it gets leached off of that kinetic energy of the magnet. So the magnet travels slower as a result, and so it takes a lot longer to get out of the bottom of the, the bottom of the tube. There's a lot of other places you can see this as well, and there's a really there's some really cool examples of this online. Let me see if I share my screen and I look at this. So I on the um, in the class resources section, I put uh, there's a there's a little file called uh, induction.html. So this has got some links to some fun stuff to go look at if you want. But this is one of my favorites. This is um, or a variation of one of my favorites. This is a big block of aluminum. And this, and he's just going to note it. The big block of aluminum is a normal block. If you knock it over, it falls over. Now he's going to put it in an NMR magnet. And you put it in an NMR magnet. He has to actually be very careful in how he puts it because it's kind of hard to move at this point. And now he's going to knock it over. And that's it falling. So what's happening is the same thing. It's the same idea. Because the magnet is moving in this magnetic field, there's a, there's a change in the magnetic flux inside this block of aluminum. So the block of aluminum has a change in flux. That change in flux induces a counter field, which turns the aluminum, the aluminum block into a magnet. And so the, um, and so that magnet interacts with the external magnetic field and slows it down. And so this is um, called an eddy current. So an eddy current is whenever you get these, um, uh, these currents running around in circles inside of a block. And eddy currents can be a major problem um, in lots of circumstances. They can be uh, an issue because, um, uh, for instance, when you're developing a, a, a motor system, an electric motor or an electric generator or something like that, you can have blocks of metal in there and those blocks of metal can be inducing currents which can leach energy out of your motor. And so there's a lot of clever design work that goes into creating electrical, moving electrical systems to avoid this kind of effect. So this is a sort of thing that's a real world problem uh, a real, and a real world effect and shows up in several different places. So there's fun stuff to be had from of that. Now, another thing that I can, um, that's worth pointing out is that if I have, oh, um, let's just share a screen, look at visualizer. So if I've got, so here's my big lump of uh, coil again. Another thing that I can do with this is um, it's, is that I can create a magnetic field not just by using a permanent magnet. I can create a magnetic field in other ways. For instance, I can take another loop of wire that, and run a current through it. So I've got a battery pack here. And so if I connect both ends of my inner loop of wire with a battery pack, I can make my needle jump. Connected, unconnected. Connected, unconnected. Now you notice when the needle jumps. The needle doesn't jump when the wire is connected. It doesn't jump as I'm running current through it. It jumps when I disconnect it or when I connect it because those are the times the magnetic flux is changing. If I'm just running a magnetic field through here, nothing changes. There's no, ch there's no changing and so there's no induced current. There's no induced EMF. But if I change the magnetic field that's going on, that's going through the inner, that's going through my orange coil, if I change that, either by starting it or by stopping it, that does induce a change in the magnetic flux and it twitches my needle. This exercise right here is what you would have done in lab if we were allowed to be in the lab without, you know, propagating a virus that would kill everybody. Um, is you would walk through this with several loops and you'd put them on a on a graph where you could see the EMF being generated as you turn the current on and off. And so this would be the game that you would play. So I'm just doing a very quick version of it here that you can see. 
and there's other stuff like this. Now, this turns out to be incredibly important, and, and one of the topics I'm going to skip over is how important this is to modern technology. This right here is called a transformer. It transforms electricity in one coil into electricity in the other coil, and that turns out to be an incredibly important device in how we deal with modern electricity, or how we deal with electricity for you. And it's probably like half of the transformers within reach of you right now as a result. They're used, it was used whenever you want to move electricity from one place to another, in particular, you may change it from high voltage to low voltage. Before we get to that, I want to want to go through one um, import, more important example of how um, electrical induction works. And so this I want to do both math mathematically and sort of physically. So this is the situation I'm going to have. So we've already dealt with this, this basic arrangement once. This was an electric motor, right? If I put a voltage across these two things here that creates a mag that creates a current in the loop, and the current in the loop feels a force due to the external magnetic field, and so can rotate the loop. And that's what you guys did right when you built your little electric motors. This is basically the same thing, except I have both wires coming out on one side instead of one wire on each side. Right? But now I'm going to do it the other way around. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this loop of wire, and instead of putting a current through it, I'm instead going to have it make a current, and I'm going to physically take this rotor and, and turn it around. So I'll attach this guy to a water wheel or a crank or something like that, and I'm going to crank him around, and I want to see what's gonna come out over here. Now, clearly, I've got a loop, it's got, there's a magnetic field, and there's something changing, so I should see something happen. So this is, so I want it, so, but I wanna work this out carefully and get, get the math done. So let's walk through a couple of, quick questions about this. So I want maximum flux through my loop, and my field lines are going this way, right? My magnetic field is going, or sorry, from this way, from north to south, right? So my magnetic field is going that way, and, I, and magnetic flux means I want the most number of field lines punching through it. So that means I want my loop to be horizontal, right? It's to be to be to be vertical like this, not horizontal. I want it to be vertical like this. So that's where I get most the most flux, okay? So I don't get the most flux. So in, well, the flux here is going to be what? If the flux, if it's horizontal. Zero. That's zero, right. Because they're in 90 degrees. So as the loop is turning, what things are changing? Seeing A, B, D, and E. Okay. So here's the first question. Is the as we rotate this thing, is the magnetic is the strength of the magnetic field B, is that changing? And we can just assume a uniform field. No, it's not changing. We're not we're not moving these magnets and we're not changing these magnets. So B is actually constant. So the field is staying constant, right? 
So now the area of the loop, is the area of the loop changing as we rotate it? No, it's not, right? We're not making it wider, we're not making it longer. The, the area of the loop is also not changing, right? What is changing is the air is the angle between the loop and the field. That is changing. So the answer here is E, that only thing changing is the angle. That's the only thing that's changing over time is how much the loop is, is aligned with or not aligned with the field. Now this is of course the question I was asking in the warm-up was if I have a loop that's changing its angle, what happens to the uh, what happens to the to so the Dr. Tag with that? I guess my confusion in that picture. So the loop we're talking about is just this like it's loop. not the disc of thing that's rotating. It's like considered like the wire, like the gray wire around the it. Gray wire. Kind of like right. and, and the gray wire. And the gray wire is on this cylinder, which is rotating. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Right. So it's not like the cylinder isn't like the thing that's conducting. It's just the thing that's holding. It's just, well, yeah, it's just it's just the it's just the thing that's holding the wire. Yeah, getting this picture straight in your head is like the whole game. Once you've got it, then it makes more sense. Okay, so now how can I write down what it is? So let's say let's say that when the loop is straight up and down, that's theta equals zero. So how would I write down the flux? It's going to be B here, right? Because this is just the expression for B dot A, right? And if you think about it, okay, if theta is zero, then cosine theta is one, and that's when I get the maximum flux, right? So then the loop is, is vertical at theta equals zero. That's when I get most flux. And when it's 90 degrees, cosine theta goes to zero, and that's when I get zero flux. And then if it turns around 180 degrees, what happens to my flux? Let somebody talk. It's big or small after I've got 180 degrees. It's big but negative. Negative, right? So whatever, so I'm using some sign convention for which way the flux is through the loop. One this way, it's going to be opposite the flux of that way. So it'll be a negative number, right? So that means I can write down my flux is now a, is now a, a number I can write down very easily. Right, so, the, so the magnetic flux is equal to A times B times cosine theta. Now, if the thing is spinning, theta is changing over time. And how in the past have you written down how something is changing over time, how theta is changing over time? if I have something that's spinning. I'm gonna need a T in there, right? Because something's changing over time, but how do I write? This goes back to first year stuff, or first semester stuff. Well, if I have it just spinning at a constant rate, it's gonna go to the same number of degrees every second. So it goes 10 degrees per second or something like that. And so we need a number in here, which is how much angle per second, right? So you angular. remember this guy? Yeah, angular velocity, you got it, right? Not so important that I hear it, but it's so important that you get that you go through your head, right? So this, and this is in radians per second, right? Not, ang not degrees per second, but it's radians per second. So this tells you how fast it's rotating, okay. So now I can write, so I can write down the flux is equal to a b cosine omega t. Okay, so now that.
And here I'll and here I'm going to keep the minus sign in place because that's meaningful about it's meaningful about which way something's happening. So I want to take the time derivative of that. So what do I get? I get Yeah, some of you got it. Okay. DDX of cosine X is equal to minus sine X. Right. So if I want to take the time derivative of this, I use the chain rule. Uh, Uh, whoop, yeah, I'm screwing myself up. So the flux is equal to a b cosine omega t. d phi d t is going to be equal to a b. The omega comes out because of the chain rule minus sine omega t. So the field, which is negative d psi dt that cancels the minus sign and I'm left with a b omega sine omega t. So this tells me what the EMF is for this thing as a function of time. So if I look at what this tells me, if I want to measure of the voltage coming out of the EMF coming out of this generator as a function of time, it's going to look like this. And the maximum voltage I'm going to get is going to have to do with how big my coil is, right? How, how, um, what the area of the coil is, how strong the magnetic field is inside that, this, that I'm using for it, and how fast I'm spinning. So if I'm spinning it very fast, not only do I get lots of these per second, but also the height of it gets bigger the faster I spin. Now this makes some sense. The faster I'm turning this crank, the more electricity I'm getting. Right? I'm putting in some energy and I'm getting it back out again. Now, this energy isn't completely free. And this is worth discussing just very briefly looking at the picture. When I even assumed that there was no friction on this whole thing, right? I should just be able to turn this really easy. I should just give it a flick and it will just keep turning. Well, that's not true. Because as soon as I put this generator on it, I have a current flowing through this wire. If I have a current flowing through this wire, that means it's creating a magnetic field. The magnetic field always works perversely by Lenz's law. And so this means that this magnet in here is always going to be fighting. So when I create this current, it'll be creating a magnet in here, which is fighting which way I'm turning it. And so it'll always be creating a backwards torque on the axis. That's called a back EMF. It's creating a backwards torque, which means it's harder to turn. Now, a very similar thing is actually happening when you make your electric motors. And that, where I think we're going to be assigning as an extra credit exercise to explain what's happening, that means that your electric motor cannot run any faster than it is. There's a limiting speed to an electric motor for your given battery and your given configuration. And it's got to do with a similar effect here, that not only do you have the magnets interacting by pushing and pulling on each other, but you also have the magnetic field creating magnetic, creating fields. And so the combination of those two things means there's always stuff going in both ways, which is very important because that guarantees energy conservation. Now, I don't want to get into that in detail. Back EMFs and backward forces are like one extra step of complication. But this 
how you get the energy out, that is something you should be able to do. And in fact, at this point, I think I, going through this exercise, except for multiple coils, that is like, I think, problem six on your homework, right? So if you just understood this, you understood how to do problem six, okay? That's, uh, I just want you to go through it again on your own to make sure you understand how it works. And that's, because this then is the fundamental mechanism by which we generate electricity. You hook that thing up to, uh, to a, um, a hydro turbine, that's something with fins that spins around, and you can do that. You hook it up to a steam generator. A steam generator generates steam, it pushes the wheel around, it generates that. You hook it up to a nuclear reactor, which generates steam. Same thing. This is the way we make all electricity. There's a couple of other variations for how you can make electricity, but this is basically the big one and the important one. And it's the one we use for nearly everything. Windmills, solar power, and, um, and direct thermal power are like the weirdos, and we can't really, but for those to understand those, you're gonna need to get into semiconductors and some weird stuff. But for most power generation, that's basically the whole thing. So it turns out that this, um, and this is part where I'm just gonna tell you a story and sort of skip forward, is that most electricity that we use is actually works like this. Instead of generating a voltage of nine volts or coming out of your wall socket, so if you have a wall socket here, right, the story I've been telling you is that there's 120 volts between the two pins in your wall socket. In fact, that's not true. What's actually true is that the voltage on one of these is close to zero and the other one is moving up and down and it moves up and down about 200 volts with an average of about 120. Now it turns out that for nearly everything you do, those are equivalent. And that's part of the math I'm just gonna skip over and I'm just telling you the story so when you encounter it again in your uh, engineering electrical courses, you'll, this will become more familiar, this will be familiar to you, but I don't really have time to get into it. The main thing is, is that this operates just the same way, is that if I have a circuit with what's called alternating current, now at this point, the resist, when you're at this point in the cycle, the resistor is generating lots of heat, and when you're in this point in the cycle, the, gener the resistor is generating no heat. But if this thing's oscillating up and down many times per second, which in the Western world is 60 times a second, then on average, this thing is just gonna put out, on average, you won't notice, right? Because this thing basically is just getting hot and it's, it doesn't get a lot hotter and cooler because it doesn't have time to cool down or heat up very much. So the average amount of energy dissipated by the, by the resistor comes out as be some time average of what's going on here. This is also really important because if I have two coils, and I have the voltage in the first one being equal to some sine wave, if that's what the voltage is in this first coil, well, then that means that it's creating a magnetic flux here, which is always changing. If it's creating a flux which is always changing, then that's creating a flux which is always changing in this coil, which means that if I look at the output of this coil, it will also be going up and down over time. So by making a current run through this coil, I can make a current run through this coil as well. I can make a current run through this wire as well without any direct direct electrical contact between this and this. Now this is really important because how much voltage I get out of this, how much field I get out of this, is proportional to how many turns I put on my coil. The more turns I put on my coil, the more magnetic field I get. The flux in this coil is proportional to B and it's proportional to the number of turns on this coil. If I have more turns of coil, this feels the magnetic field more strongly. If I have more turns on this coil, it makes the magnetic field more strong. That means, and this is the cool part, by tuning these two numbers, I can determine how big my output is going to be. If I have lots of turns on this coil, it means I'm going to increase my output and, and so on. By tuning these two coils, I can change the V in versus V out to make V out smaller than V in or make it bigger than V in, which is very, very cool. I can change and increase or decrease voltages. Now it turns out that this is the important reason why we use alternating current, is this little thing with the two coils I just showed you a minute ago. That's called a transformer. And transformers work because 
One coil creates a time-changing flux, and the other coil feels a time-changing flux and creates a current. Because you can do this, it means that I can move from high voltage to low voltage and with almost no energy loss. Very, very small energy losses, like 1%. This is cool because high voltage is efficient for moving electricity from place to place, but it's dangerous. Low volt is like 10,000 volts is what high, high tension, high voltage wires you'll see running by the highway. They're running at like 10,000 volts, 100,000 volts, really high voltage. You don't want any part of that because those can throw massive sparks which can set fires and electrocute people. In your house, you use 110 volts, 120 volts. And for that, you can step down the voltage using a transformer. You can take high voltage and step it down to low voltage. And there's one of these things. These are the big humming gray boxes on the corner of your block. Or if you live out in the country, it's a, it's a cylinder that sits on the telephone pole outside your house, if you, if you have a country house. And there's, so there's main wires coming in and little wires coming out. So this allows you to step the voltage up or down as you need, as, as you need it. And so we can run low voltage in our houses, which is a lot safer and a lot more convenient for use. And we can run high voltage long distances, which is much, much more efficient in terms of energy. Normally in this course, I would tell a big long story. This is in fact, um, uh, this is in fact the fight between Westinghouse and, and Tesla. And the reason why Tesla, you know, won this whole fight and why we work with, uh, Ed sorry, Westinghouse and, Edison, Westinghouse and Tesla versus Edison. Edison worked with DC currents and we don't do that anymore. And he lost this fight. This is like a major fight for the ages. Um, uh, like the fight between VHS and Betamax, or the fight between uh, streaming services, or the fight um, between USB and the Apple ports and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go into any more detail on this other than the basic idea of it, which I am going to ask you on the, uh, on the uh, homework. Okay. So this is a reasonable place to stop. I'm now going to skip large parts of the textbook, which go into the practical details of how this works. Um, and we're going to move on to a couple other things. I might go into this in slightly more detail next time. I have to rearrange my notes for next time. Um, so the reading for the next couple of days is going to be kind of weird. In the meantime, about the first half of homework 10, which I posted, you can do now. And so you should get a start on that this weekend. Um, and then I think I have it due like a week after we get back from Easter break. Um, but get a, get a start on it now, especially if you have a lot of other work that you know it's going to pile up later in the semester. But I wanted to give you maximum flexibility so you could work on it when you wanted. Um, you're all, you've all been doing this college thing for at least a year, so now you should be good at starting to schedule your own time and know that you can't put things off. And the beginning of the, well, okay, maybe not. You're better at it than you used to be, right? The beginning of the year, you weren't so good at it. The beginning of the year, you guys, you know, like, you know, you were doing all your homework the night before. And I think at this point, I have trained you not to do all of your physics homework the night before. You might be still be doing it, but you know you shouldn't. Okay, you'll, you'll go with that one. All right. At least you'll feel guilty for doing it the wrong way. That's all I really ask. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll come back to this next time. Any questions, comments, thoughts before I move on? All right, we'll call it there for today. Everyone have a good Easter. Stay safe. Let me know if there's anything going yeah. on. Yeah. Sorry. I was just saying you too. Okay. We'll have a good Easter. All right. Um, uh, hit me up in an email or on Slack if you have questions about the midterm. If you'd like to see me do a little video with midterm answers, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, I won't do it if nobody wants it, but I'm happy to do that if you want to walk through some of the answers in the midterm. Um, and uh, let me know if there's any problems, but the reason why the homework's being hard for you right now, I want to be, I want to remain sensitive in case, you know, things are about to start going sideways, even in Ohio. We're going to hit peak COVID in about a week and a half. So, you know, people are going to start noticing uh, soon. So let me know if you've got any problems, if anything's going on, or if you're just confused and just want a little more help, um, I'm happy to arrange some office hours and we can talk one-to-one, -one, stuff like that. And we want to we want to get all through this all together. Have a good one.